Good morning. I'm Jeff Jerka, and I'll be reading the lesson for today. Uh, our lesson is from the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you picked up a Bible as you entered today, um, you'll find the lesson on page 1097. And if you don't happen to have a Bible of your own, please uh, take that Bible as our gift to you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance to do. This is the word of our Lord. I totally get that there might be a confusion between which is better, ice cream or heaven. <laughs> Especially graters, raspberry chocolate chunks, ice cream is good. Today is Reformation Sunday, and we're going to get all theological right out of the blocks today, okay? So be patient with this, track with this, don't, you know, zone out. Because um, I, what I want to do today is I want to lead us to a point where each of us has an opportunity to make a personal Reformation thesis. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the sermon. If you're a guest with us today, uh, don't be freaked out by the word theology. Theology is just a word that means the talk of or study of God. And it's what followers of Jesus do. Because we want to understand God and God's relationship to us. It's what the whole Bible really is, is theology about our relationship with God. So I invite you to get out your sermon outline as we continue this teaching series, actually conclude this teaching series on relationships. The Reformation was a lot of movements back in 16th century Europe. There was, it was a political movement. It was a technological movement. It was a social movement. It was a justice movement. So there was a lot of movements all coming together that made the Reformation. But at its origin, the Reformation was a theological movement with this Catholic monk and professor named Martin Luther sitting up in his study, reading the book of Romans, and trying to understand God. In other words, doing theology. That was its origin as a theological movement. And, and at the heart of that theological movement was the proper distinction. Now, hang with me. This is when we're going to get real theological here. Was the proper distinction between what is called the theological use of the law and the gospel. The theological use of the law and the gospel. So as I go through this today, here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to decide for yourself, at this time in your life, which do you more need to hear? The law or the gospel? Now, obviously our first inclination is, of course, the gospel. But understand that at different points in our life, we need to hear each. Both are important. 
Don't kind of dismiss the law as kind of, oh, that's bad. We don't want to ever think about that. It's important to understand that we need both to hear the law and the gospel in our lives. And what I want to invite you to do is to decide which one do you need to hear more right now in your life. So we begin with the law. There is what is called the first use of the law, the civil use of the law. That is, the laws of the country you live in. We're not going to talk about that use of law, but that's an important one, right? We have to have laws that say, for example, you can't send pipe bombs to those people that you disagree with. Or you can't go into a synagogue because you don't like Jewish people and shoot them up. We have to have laws that restrain evil. That's the first use or the civil use of the law. As important as that is, we're not talking about that use of law. We're talking about what theologians call the second use or the theological use of the law. This teaches us how we stand before God, about our relationship with God on our own merits before God. It's taught throughout the Bible, but of all the places it's taught, the one teaching that I always think first of when I think of this use of the law, the teaching of Jesus, is this. That's not it. (laughs) That does make me crazy sometimes. It's true. Here it is. You'll see how crazy this makes you. By the way, I had some people come into this service saying, I heard that we're going to hate your sermon today. And it's probably because of what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> Jesus commanded, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So how you doing with that? How you doing with that? This is this theological use of the law. You see... The law puts an end to our schemes to make ourselves right or to be good enough because we can't. None of us here can say, yeah, I'm I'm all up on that be perfect business. I'm there. None of us can say that based on our own merits. The law, in a sense, puts us to death. Because it condemns us and leaves us with no hope. If we have to be perfect in order to be forgiven and spend eternity with God, we have no hope. It puts us to death. That's the bad news. That's what people probably said. I'm, you're going to hate that sermon. Now here's the gospel what is called the good news. It's all about Jesus and what Jesus did, whereas the law is about us and what we can't measure up to. The gospel, the good news, is all about what Jesus and he accomplished for us on the cross. We have this fancy theological word, justification, which means that because of what Jesus did in his death and resurrection, we are justified, we are made right with God. So in one sense, in in fact, in a more perfect sense, when I said, how are you all doing with being perfect? You could all, if you trusted in Jesus, you could say, yeah, I'm there. I'm perfect. Not because of what I've done. Because of what Jesus did. He has made us perfect, righteous before God. And this sets us free. It sets us free from this Anxiety of having to live up to some standard in order to be right with God. Jesus promised this. So if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. The gospel sets us free. It sets us free from the having to follow the law in order to be right with God. It sets us free from having to be good enough And this is the difference between Christianity and every other belief system on the planet. Because every other belief system on the planet is a matter of being good enough to get whatever is the good things at the end of your life or during your life. And Christianity swims 
the opposite direction and says, it's not about what we do. It's what Jesus has already done for us. So, I'm going to talk, talk more about the law and the gospel. For right now, what do you think you need to hear more at this point in your life? The law or the gospel? Kind of decide that for yourself, but I want to give you a caution. Examine your answer. Because my experience has been, this isn't true for everyone that I've talked with this about, but it's true for a lot as they've described what they need to hear, what they think they need to hear more in their life, it has often been the case that they really need to hear the other one more. It may be true for you, maybe not, but examine that. And maybe the thing is to listen to both of them, okay? And then decide. In Ephesians 2, chapter 2, the Apostle Paul teaches this tension between the law and the gospel. First, the law. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. This is teaching us that when we were, before trusting Jesus, we were spiritually dead. In fact, this is the way we are born. We're not capable of finding God because there's not a spiritual ounce of life within us. When you're dead, you can't do anything. And this is what this is teaching. This is why it's probably people hated this sermon in the first service. We're spiritually dead because of our rebellion against God and his values. In which you used to follow, when you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. What's that a reference to? The ruler of the kingdom of the air. The evil one. Some people call Satan or devil. It says, before faith, we are spiritually dead. And if we're following anyone, we're not following God. We're following the evil one and the ways of this world, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. This is bad news for us. This is the law that condemns us, that leaves us with no hope that we're dead. And when it says the ways of this world, that we used to follow, you know, the ways of this world, it certainly means our sins, our rebellion against God and God's values, his commands in the Bible, but it also means what we trust in. You see, because the way the world functions is not by grace, not by mercy, but it functions by merit, or what they call in the East, karma. You get what you deserve. You reap what you sow. So if you're going to get good things, you got to be good enough. That's the way the world is wired. And before we understand who Jesus is, That's how we're wired. That's how we behave. That's why, maybe for some of us today, we have this burden of, I got to be good enough. I got to be enough of something in order to feel right about life. And that's the ways of this world. And just so we understand, this is true for all of us. Because look to what Paul says next. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just as everyone, like everyone else. In other words, Paul's saying, there's none of us here, there's none of us here who can stand up and say, oh, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm pretty good. You know, I do a number of funerals, obviously, as a pastor. And, you know, every funeral, almost every funeral, it, something is said like this. Oh, he was a good person. She was a good person. And I'm like, I'm sure they are. In fact, 
a lot of times I know them and I can say yes. But I say to myself, that don't matter. Because they weren't good enough. That's what the law is. You see, the law kills. The law puts an end to our schemes to th- try to make ourselves right or good enough. And, it, and it's, we're left with no hope. No hope. No way out. Let's just breathe out. Because without even taking a breath, The Apostle Paul that in this wonderful passage, in the tension of this passage, moves immediately without even a hesitation to the gospel. After kind of killing us with the law, he moves right to the gospel. The gospel means good news. And he says this, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we're dead in our transgressions. It is by grace You have been saved. This passage is saying that God's way is rich in mercy. James, the brother of Jesus, taught this in this uh, focusing passage that we've used for this whole series. This is what he said. The wisdom that comes from heaven, that is God's way, is first of all, and here's been the outline of the series, right? We've looked at each of these words over the last number of weeks. It's first of all, pure, the peace-loving, considerate, submissive. Now last week we kind of skipped ahead and Aaron taught well about being impartial and sincere. And we saved this last one for Reformation Sunday because it fits better with Reformation Sunday. It's full of mercy and good fruit. These are the ways of God in relationships and his relationship with us. God's God's way in relationships is full of mercy. Full of mercy. And that's really good news for us because if it was any other way, we'd have no hope. We'd be left with, I hope I'm good enough. I hope I, you know, if there's some scale, like I got more good than bad. Remember, we're not just talking about our deeds, but also our thoughts and our words and what we leave undone. So it's so good for us that it's, he's rich in mercy. Here's again that gospel verse we were just looking at. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in our transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. That's what we really emphasize, especially in Reformation Sunday, that we're saved by grace. In other words, it's all God's work. We haven't done anything. We haven't done one iota to make us right with God. We don't meet him halfway. We don't meet him like at 30% or 10% or even, you know, 0.00001%. We do nothing to receive God's grace. It comes to us all by his effort, even our faith to believe in him is his gift to us, coming to us in the preaching of his word, in the evangelism that comes to us through other people. That's, it's all God's work. And thank God it is. Because if there was even a smidgen of something we had to do, we'd all be left wondering, did I do that? Did, Did I really do it? Did I do that enough? And so we'd get to the end of our lives and we're like, I hope I'm going to heaven. I don't really know. I just hope. I I think I've been good enough. See? It's left with anxiety and no hope. But we're saved by grace. Three verses later, Paul says it again. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. It's not partially a gift. It's not half a gift. It's the whole gift, not by any work on our own. So that none of us can in any way boast, or I would say, or be anxious. We don't need to be anxious because it's not up to us. That's the gospel. That's the defining teaching of Christianity. Martin Luther said this is a teaching on which the church stands or falls. This is the basic foundational 
what the writer of Hebrews said, the elementary teachings of the Christian way. Do you understand this? And do you believe it? I've been in this work long enough to know that there could be someone that is sitting in church week after week after week, decade after decade, and this light still hasn't gone on. That they're still thinking there's something they have to do enough of. I've had folks who have been in church for decades and one day say, you know, it finally clicked. I finally understand that it's not about what I've, I do, but what Jesus has already done. And if that's where you're at, if you came in this morning, you know, and deep down inside you, there's this anxiety about, you know, I hope I go to heaven. I hope I'm good enough, whatever it is. Your reformation day, your personal reformation, I invite you to, to surrender and accept this free gift of God's salvation. That may be your personal reformation today. Well, that's, that was the reformation 501 years ago that began. And, it's, and we need to hear that. From time to time, all of us do. And it may be your personal reformation, but here's my thought. I believe that for many of us here today, myself included, this is not the reformation that we need to hear most. It's important that we are reminded because we'll forget about it, but it's not the reformation that we maybe need to hear most. I think many of us need to hear the reformation that Paul describes in his next verse in this passage. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do, I'm going to say this on Reformation Sunday in the Lutheran Church, good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The response to the mercy that God has given us in Christ is to show the same mercy to others and to do the good works in their life. The response for us who have understood that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus is good works. Faith and good works. And the good works that Jesus most often, in fact, almost all the time, teaches us about is how we treat other people. It's how we treat other people. So God's way in relationships is full of mercy and good work. And you know this. And you know what those good works are. We've gone over them in this series. It's pure. It's peace-loving. It's considerate. It's willing to yield. It's impartial. It's sincere. It's honest. It means to serve others ahead of yourself. It means to build others up. It means to follow through in the promises that you made and to be honest with them and to live the commands in the Bible that God gives us as we treat other people. That's what it means to live in relationships and do good works in the lives of others. This is the reformation that I believe many of us need today. The reformation of understanding that we're saved by grace alone, that's so important, it's, it's foundational. It's what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 6 are the elementary teachings of the faith. It's the foundation. You can't take another step until you understand and accept that. But once that's in place, we live the rest of our lives in service to others to meet their hopes and their hurts in whatever way God leads us to do, to do the right things in those relationships. So, Here's the concluding takeaway for this whole series that kind of puts it all together. To get what you want most in your relationships, show the same mercy to others that God shows to you in Jesus and do what is good and right in your relationships. So we're going to move to the end of the sermon here. Skip number six in the outline. 
I'm going to invite you to make a personal reformation today. Uh, in the uh, pockets in the uh, chairs, Mr. Tongue and Mr. Lips, come on, let's go. Uh, would you reach out and grab this card? Reach out and grab this card, and you might need to reach behind you if you're in the front row. I want everyone, anyone not have this card, if you don't have a card, raise your hand, and the usher will come bring you. Anyone have, not have a card, please get one. When Martin Luther sparked the Reformation, not that he intended to do that, he nailed 95 theses. These are statements. He nailed them on a church door 501 years ago today. I'm going to invite you to make a similar statement, a thesis, a, a statement. And, and, and if for you, the, the personal reformation is to take a, that step of faith of accepting God's grace, that it's not by your works, but by the work of Christ, there's a prayer there that you can pray to accept that free gift of salvation. And you might, even if you've done that before, want to pray that prayer again, or, or in your own words, I've, you can certainly do your own words, but sometimes people like to have a prayer laid out for them, and there's one that I've written. Below that is a blank space. And so you know where you're at in your life right now. You know what is the personal reformation you need to make. And if it's something other than that, just write that out. However you want. And then you can sign it, and you can date it, make it your prayer. So as we sing this next song, as we move into Holy Communion, Make this a time of personal reformation for you. And then I'm going to, and if, if you're surrendering your life to Jesus for the first time today, accepting that gift, you can check that box. If you're recommitting your life, you can check that box. But I'm going to invite you, I'm going to give you a couple options here. One, you could just keep this card, take it home, put it in a place that will remind you. Or, after you receive community, after you receive, you know, the ultimate sign of uh, means of grace in our lives the holy sacrament as you go back to your chairs instead of going right back to your row you can go back to the door there and there's a cart there with tape dispensers now if martin luther had been alive today he'd probably use tape but the property team said no nailing on the door today so there's tape back there and you can take a piece of tape and you can put it on the door as a kind of like this is my personal reformation day just like martin luther did 501 years ago or you can, at the end of the service, as you leave today, you can do that. There, it'll still be there. Let's make this now a time of personal reformation for us. I invite us into prayer as we begin this. Gracious Lord God, every now and then we need to have a time of surrender and recommitment in our lives. We all need that, Lord, in our walk with you because we so easily go astray. So we ask, Lord, now that you'd speak to each of us in the way that each of us need to hear. The law, the gospel, and especially those folks today who realize now that they've never really accepted that free gift. Lord, would you speak to them and would you move us all to this time of personal reformation and have us respond in whatever way is right for us. We pray this now in the name of Jesus.